Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Live with CDP podcast on this, uh, what is it, Wednesday, January 26th. It's hard to believe uh, we're almost going into February. So um, this is uh, season two, episode 55 of Live with CDP podcast. And this is my 12th podcast in the month of January. And uh, between January and December, this is my 23rd podcast. Anyways, I look forward to tonight's guest. Uh, he's uh, coming on for a second appearance on Live with CDP podcast, Mike Hogan. Uh, Mike Hogan from the Toronto Argonauts. He's a manager of their communications department. He's also their long, uh, long time play by play uh, voice of the Argonauts on uh, TSN 1050. And he's also a digital writer for the Argonauts.ca. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, to Mike about the uh, the 21 CFL season returning, uh, the 21 Argonauts who won the East in the regular season at nine and five, and talk a little bit about the NFL playoffs and and the uh, Philadelphia Eagles and maybe what happened to the Green Bay Packers as well. So uh, just one second, I'm going to bring on the uh, voice of the Toronto Argonauts, Mike Hogan. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Doing great, Chris. How are you? Good. Thank you so much again for coming on. My pleasure. Love doing it. Uh, how was your day? Uh, busy, which is good. You know, I, I think people uh, think that, oh, what is a, what does anybody do in the off season uh, of a sport? Uh, you'd be surprised. A couple of meetings today, uh, preparing for free agency, which begins in a couple of weeks, and just uh, just doing the do and getting ready. You know, the old is it June yet becomes is it May yet this year because of the early season. And you know, we're not that far away from camp opening in the grand scheme of things. So just just really happy to be talking football again. Yeah, 120 days to the Eagle, the the Argles' uh, first preseason game at Ottawa. Wow, wow, sneaking I, up! I cheated. I was on the website before I came on tonight. 120 days. So yeah, I guess Ottawa and Hamilton in the preseason, and then uh, the home opener is against the uh, Alouettes, I believe, on Thursday, June 16th at 7:30. Can't wait. Uh, you know, the the exhibition games or preseason games uh, are there for a reason. Yeah, um, it's an opportunity for guys who are on the bubble uh, to show what they've got and make the team. Uh, some players really didn't benefit by that last season because there were no preseason games because of the COVID restrictions. So for guys who are, you know, trying to live the dream of playing professional football and, you know, uh, are, are that kind of guy, you know, it, it, maybe we don't know that much about them or want to see what they can do on a bigger field. It's an opportunity for them to shine. And some guys have really taken – uh, advantage of that in the past, and and maybe Chad Cackard, uh, who was the MVP uh, of the of the 2012 Grey Cup, uh, is the best example of that. He may not have met, met uh, made the team in 2012 if it wasn't for a preseason game he had in Winnipeg. So uh, preseason games might not mean that much to the fans, but to the coaching staff and the players, it means a lot. Yeah. Now I know the NFL went down to three. There's talk of some of them even trying to get rid of it altogether, but I agree with what you just said there, Mike, it might not be for the fans, but the coaches and the general managers need to be able to see how these guys will do in game type situations. Well, you see in preseason and you know, I, we saw it as well. And I think fans really got upset um, back in the day when the NFL was having preseason games uh, at the Rogers Center, and you know it would be Green Bay coming up here, and oh, Brett Favre's going to play, and Brett Favre would throw the ball once, and then would be out, and it would be the backups in. Um, for players of that ilk uh, in either league, when you've got your your bona fide starters, you know they're going to start. They're veterans. There's really not that much that can happen during a preseason game other than them to get hurt. So you don't want to expose them to that. You know, if you were to lose a uh, an all-star caliber player in a preseason game, it would just be the worst. And preseason games really aren't that much fun in any sport, uh, but they do serve a purpose. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the CFL used to go with four preseason, preseason games like the NFL did. That was too many. It, it really was. And you were starting to lose guys to injury. So 
what the CFL did uh, essentially was take the two preseason games and turn them into regular season games. The schedule went from 16 to 18 games, and uh, they're still playing 20 games. It's just two are preseason instead of four. Well, this is how old I am. I remember in the late 70s, the NFL had six preseason games, yeah. six preseason games. And that was unbelievable back then, six. So, yeah, it, it just didn't make a lot of sense. You know, yeah. you, you you don't, you know, like I say, I, instead, you know, I don't want to re reiterate, but I mean, you just, you don't want to lose a player to injury in a preseason no. game. And we've seen that in the past. Now, I got to ask you this. Um, I didn't write this question down, but is, are the Argonauts planning on having their training camp again in Guelph or that hasn't been decided yet? I think it's been decided it hasn't been announced, so I don't want to let any cats out of the bag here. I'll wait until we do uh, the official announcement. But uh, Guelph was was spectacular. Um, last year, they did so much, and it, the, the facilities are fantastic. Um, you know, we had to go through the whole COVID thing last year. We weren't allowed to invite people out to camp, and we couldn't do the quote-unquote fan day for folks on, on one of the Saturdays. And everybody was really down about that because we really, really like that interconnection with the fans. We just couldn't have it last year. Um, Guelph was great. The facilities were fantastic. Um, the the workout facilities, the weight room are just top notch. The, the the locker rooms. We actually needed to use three different locker rooms last year uh, because you needed spacing in the the two main locker rooms. Yep. And the uh, they were doing work on the grandstand at the University of Guelph and underneath it, so we didn't have uh, access to those locker rooms either. So. Uh, the other ones were way up at the uh, the athletic center, so uh, it was a bit of a hype. But uh, uh, you know, the the equipment staff did a fantastic job trying to you know man both locker rooms, and uh, Guelph was just a great spot to have camp. The the the, the, the footing, the the surface is really good, and just just top shelf. Really good cooperation from Guelph. They were great hosts. Well, I'll cross my fingers that it's Guelph again, and and if if fans are allowed this summer, which would be nice, I'd like to be able to come up and watch some uh, training camp up there as well. Love to have you. It's it really is fun, and, and the great thing about training camp is, and, and like practices on any day for Argo fans, uh, a it's free. You can go and watch. You can bring the kids uh, in a normal circumstance again in a in a non COVID year. You can you can have the kids go up and get autographs afterwards, and the players are really happy to do it. So. Uh, it's it's a it's a good opportunity that I don't think a lot of fans take advantage of the way they could. Okay, definitely. We'll, we'll cross your fingers that the uh, um, the fans will be allowed to come this summer. I things are getting a little bit better, and hopefully by the summertime, um, fans will have access. Will be able to go to training camp again and 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 stuff like that with uh, the team and stuff like that. And that's why I love about the CFL is the players are more accessible to the fans and the NFL or any of these other leagues. Uh, yeah, and that's that is one of the great things about the CFL, and it's it's not just you know practices, games, etc. But you know, compare going to the Super Bowl as a fan to going to the Grey Cup as a fan. Uh, I've been to both, and you know, the the Super Bowl is for sponsors, league yeah. sponsors essentially. Uh, if you don't have a lot of Benjamins in your pocket uh, down in the states, you're not going to any of the events. Up here, you go to the Spirit of Edmonton, and if a player's not in that game. You know how many Hall of Fame players are going to go and drink with the fans and and current players who aren't playing. It's just it's 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 different than any other league, uh, and that's that's really a big part of the charm for me for the CFL is I can't think of another league where fans and players and coaches and broadcasters and writers and just everybody involved with the league are able to intersect the way they do and just just go out and socialize. I mean that's 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 a big big part of the attractiveness of this league. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, Mike, you might not have the answer to it. What's the latest on the Halifax exp expansion team? Is that still? Yeah, it was, uh, as far as I know, the, like they want to do it. It's just, uh, the, the you know, it was put on hold, obviously, with, with COVID. And they're, they're, they don't have a spot yet, as far as I know, for a building. Um, they've got an ownership group in place, but they've got to get the building built. And, you know, the, the, the three things that you need to make a CFL franchise work, great ownership, great facility, and great fan base uh, where you're able to draw from people. And, uh, you know, I the only football game I've seen in Halifax was, uh, an, uh, was it a UTEC or it would have been a UTEC Bowl uh, when I was doing Laurier play-by-play -play back in 2005 uh, and Laurier advanced national semifinal. We had a great time. I mean, that's my only time to Halifax and what a great town. And, 
uh, for fans getting ready to take a road trip. Uh, holy smokes, what a what a great city to go and explore. And, you know, it's a you hear about that East Coast hospitality. I can tell you firsthand it's alive and well. And uh, I really want to go back to Halifax at, at some point, whether it's with the Argonauts or not, because we were treated so well. And boy, what a party town. I mean, just people really love to have a good time out there. And I, I can't wait to go back. And hopefully it's with the Argos. And I, I think a tenth team in the CFL would be perfect. It would be five in the East, five in the West, and there would be more balance. To me, that would be perfect to have in the team there on that on the East Coast. Yeah, the odd number can be problematic. And, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to make the playoffs right now uh, in the East, I guess, because, you know, a team in the West would have to have more points in that fourth to third spot to, to win a crossover. So uh, it, it just, in terms of numbers, it's, it's a little bit easier. So uh, I'm sure the folks in the West would love to see that where it is even um, and make it a little more difficult. It might eliminate the crossover. I don't know that the, they'd have to get to that, but uh, yeah, maybe they go to one, one league, 10 teams, one division. Uh, you know, that's a possibility as well. So I don't know what they do, but I just, I, I, I want to be in a position where when Halifax comes in, everything is fine. Building is great. Ownership yep. is still solid, and the fans are ready to go. Uh, because I think I think uh, a team in Halifax will work. Okay, and uh, I was going to ask you this too. Are, are you going to be able to do some road games with the Argos this year on the radio? Or are you no, just going to be doing all the so. home games? Yeah, the last few years, last three seasons, I think it's just been the home games, and uh, I love traveling. Uh, I mean, I just it's after having done the play by play for so long. I can't tell you how weird it was to watch that team play a game on television. It was, it had been like over a decade and uh, it was weird because you want to be there obviously as a fan, as much as a broadcaster and as an employee of the team. Uh, but just to, to, it was, it was actually pretty weird to watch games. It still is to a degree uh, because I want to be there. And uh, I hope uh, we're able to do it this year. Uh, I don't know if it's being discussed at a higher level, uh, I'd love to do it. I know the social media team would love to have me out there to to do some hits day before the game and the day of the game as well, and do a post game. So uh, fingers crossed, uh, we'll we'll find out. But uh, I'm not I'm not hiding anything. I don't know yet. But uh, okay. would I love to do it? Absolutely. Yeah, because I I think with the Raptors and the Leafs uh, announcers right now, they're doing the games in Toronto when they're at home. The Raptors and the Leafs, but they're not traveling with the team currently still. Yeah, and I don't know how much of that is cost. How much of that is uh, is COVID? So it's uh, uh, I don't know if uh, if Bonesy and company will be doing that when the Leafs get up and going, and and Jonesy and, and Smitty with the Raptors. So uh, we'll find out, I guess. But uh, yeah, it's I, I also it's 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 it just is beneficial, I think, to do a radio only call as opposed to the simulcast, just because um, you know people can't see when they're driving their cars. Obviously, if they're listening to the game. Uh, you have to tell them where the ball is. You have to tell them down a distance. If you're calling the game on television, people can see where the ball is. Uh, people know what the score is because it's constantly on the screen or how much time is left or how many yards they need for the first down. Radio is a different broadcast. I've done both, and it's it's a lot more difficult to do a radio broadcast because you have to be a lot more detail-oriented. Absolutely. you got to paint more of a picture than television. Yes. Definitely. Okay. Um, I was going to, that's going to get to me in my next question, I guess I wanted to ask you since we're talking CFL and the Argos, we might uh, do this part first. What were your overall thoughts on the 2021 Toronto Argonauts season and um, the East final against Hamilton? Obviously the Argos were up 12, nothing, but I always told my friend, I said, when you kick field goals in a playoff game, it always comes back to bite you in the, in the at the, in the in, in most cases, yeah, it was tough. I mean, the, I'll start with the regular season first. Okay. And after coming off back to back four and fourteen seasons, and then a zero and zero season uh, in the season that was was uh, was canceled, to go nine and five, you know, no disrespect to Edmonton, but if we had have started our starters, we would have been ten and four uh, because their starters barely beat our practice roster in in the last game of the season. Um, you know. It was the regular season was fantastic. Uh, there were so many really close games and dramatic games. You know, we had the benefit of a couple of missed kicks that allowed us to win or or or, or hold on to a win. Uh, and you know, a guy like Boris Beatty kicking a fifty-one yarder in Hamilton on the last play of the game. Uh, you know, in a wild comeback, uh, the dominance over Winnipeg at home, the dominance in the last game over Hamilton, 
in the regular season to clinch first place in the East. There were some really fantastic moments in the regular season, and that was just in a 14-game season. You know, we have four more to go uh, this year. Uh, so from the regular season, I thought it was fantastic. Playoffs, uh, man, when you get two teams that uh, were as closely – uh, balanced, I think, in terms of roster strength as Toronto and Hamilton were this year. Um, you knew they were going to be close games. And basically everyone but Labor Day was. Uh, and maybe, okay, Labor Day in the, whole, the last home game. So two of the four were kind of one-sided. There were some really good games in the other three. And, uh, you know, you're right. When you when you don't capitalize on opportunities and, you know, if Jagarrett Davis at defensive end doesn't make a remarkable play to go out and cover a running back down the sidelines, uh, and have the, the presence of mind to turn around, find the football, and knock it down. That's a touchdown instead of a field goal. Um, draw play, McLeod Bethel-Thompson. One more block gets made, he walks into the end zone. So, you know, there's potentially eight points that were left on the board. 20 to nothing at halftime is a lot better than 12 to nothing at halftime. And Absolutely. who knows, maybe it is a different game. But full marks to Hamilton. They made, uh, they made big plays when they had to. They turned things around. The Argos couldn't stop Dane Evans when he got in a quarterback. They had a big punt return. Um, you know, good for them. But, you know, the atmosphere before that game was pretty wild. Uh, it was it was fun to see the building uh, using the upper deck on the far side, uh, looking down at the tailgate before the game started and how busy it was in the, uh, in the uh, parking lot to the south of BMO Field. There was so much atmosphere building up to that game. That's what we have to replicate on a, on a regular basis with the Argos. And I think just if people go down and give it a chance, um, you know, there's a stigma right now about the Argos and the CFL. And a lot of it is from people who have never even given the game a chance uh, mm -hmm. we them to come down. It's a cheap ticket, $5 beers, $3 hot dogs, come down, yeah. have a great time and, uh, and watch it to a winning team in Toronto compete for a great cup. Well, like I said, with me, I just drive to Burlington, take the go train right into the exhibition grounds, and and that way, it I don't have to worry about traffic or uh, the parking or whatever. And it's it's right, it's it's a great site right there. Oh, I'm I'm same with you, Whitby. I don't I, I kind of mix it up depending on what time I'm going to be in at the stadium, uh, or what day of the week it is. Uh, if it's a Friday, sometimes I'll I'll just easily opt to take the go train, and you hop off the go train at exhibition, and you're in the stadium uh, in literally a one minute walk. Uh, yeah. You know, I take the GO train into work every day when I'm in there. Well, not every 90% of the time. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's an easy commute, especially coming from east to west. For people who are up north, it's a little bit because you have to, you have to make that transfer at Union Station. But, uh, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the talk about how difficult it is to BMO, there are nights where that is true, but there is a way around it. You've just got to find it and use, and use public transit. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to going to my first game there since 2018. And, and like I said, I've always grew up with the CFL, and I've loved the CFL, the NFL, in college football. And uh, people who don't like it, you're right, Mike. In most cases, they've never even watched a game or been to a game live. And it's like the beer commercial, right? Uh, those who like it, like it a lot. And, and you find out that the people who are into the CFL love the CFL. And you know, they're not just going to watch the Argos or the Thai Cats or the Rough Riders or the Red Blacks. They're for the most part going to watch two or three or even all four games over the course of a week. And they're diehard fans. And I heard it put to me that uh, recently that, you know, most leagues would kill to have as passionate a fan base as the CFL has. What we have to do now as a team and as a league is expand that fan base. And and I don't want to say compete with the NFL because I love both. You love yeah. both. Like you're yeah. allowed to like different brands yeah. of football. I love U sports football. I really love watching NCAA football. Uh, a good football game to me is a good football game. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll go watch, you know, when my stepson was playing OVFL or playing high school football, I'd go and watch that and just, I'd enjoy it for what it is. And I've, I've used the analogy before. If you've heard it, please bear with me. In the States, if you live in Texas or Pennsylvania or Ohio or wherever, you can go out on a Friday night and you can watch the local high school team under Friday night lights and you can really get into it and have a good time and appreciate that for the level that it is. And you can go out the next day on the Saturday and you can watch Texas A&M play or Ohio State or Michigan or whichever area of the country you're in and you can enjoy the college football game as much as you enjoy the high school game, knowing that most of the players on that high school team are not going to go and play D1 football. 
And then on Sunday, if you live in Texas, you can go watch the Cowboys or the Texans play, and you can enjoy that as much as you did watch the Longhorns or Aggies the day before, and you can enjoy that as much as you watched uh, the high school game on the Friday night. It's football. It's competitive football. And I don't know why we have to be that way in Canada where it's it's the NFL or the CFL. I don't understand the mindset. I've been a fan of both leagues since I was a kid. Same here. Continue to to embrace them. Is it? And the other thing, and I'm on the rant, excuse me. It's Chris. okay. You know, I even I, I lost my train of thought, but there was there was another thing that I was going to mention about just being able to enjoy the different levels of football. And, you know, we're, oh, there it is. We're lucky because not only do we have different levels of football like they do in the States and NFL, NCAA high school, we have different rules. Yeah. And, and that leads to different strategies. So I can watch the Argos play on a Friday night, let's say, and think, try to think the strategy and try to, you know, play along with the coaches and what should they do here? What's open, blah, blah, blah. And then I can watch an Eagles game on the Sunday, get into it the same way. And it's a different strategy. So when you're kind of playing that game, which everybody does at home, you play along, what should they run here? What do you want to see here? Um, You can do that. And it's two different strategies with the same game. Yeah. We're lucky in Canada that we can embrace both because they don't in the United States. They've got four down football, period. End of yeah. story. I like both. I like three down and I like four down. Both games have their rules and 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 their uniqueness. And I just hope the CFL, Mike, doesn't go to four downs. I really hope they keep three downs. I'm with you. And here's, here's a question I'll ask NFL fans on a regular basis. Um, and I still haven't really heard a good one yet. Take the rules. Not and let's let's leave four and three down out of it because that's a different discussion. But just the rules of the sport. Name one NFL rule that's more fan friendly than a CFL rule in terms of entertainment value. Do you prefer the return or do you prefer the fair catch? Do you prefer the kickoff out of bounds every time virtually yep. in an NFL game? Yep. Or do you like the fact that some dangerous fast player is going to touch the football on every yep. kickoff? Um, you know, there are the yard off the ball, you know, that's advantageous to an offense. So, I mean, they're, they're, they're for the most part, motion makes the game faster where you can take a four, four guy in the U S he's still going to be a four, four guy. You take a four, four guy in Canada and you give him a running start. That four, four is now a four, two. It's a, it, it makes an average receiver fast. It makes a fast receiver really fast. And that's, that's just another part. It's it's a more fan friendly game. Missed field goal returns. There's, yeah. in my estimation, there's no more exciting play in the Canadian Football League than a missed field goal return because you've got more blockers staying at home to protect the field goal kicker that can't get downfield. And all of a sudden, especially on a long field goal, and this is why coaches don't try as many long field goals in the CFL. Um, all of a sudden, you've got a really dangerous guy looking downfield and seeing nothing but 30 yards of open field in front of them. Wow. That's exciting. Definitely. I, I agree with Mike, like I said, uh, and the, and, and, and people complain about the NFL overtime rule as well. I was going to ask you that before I get to a viewer uh, comment here, what's your take on the uh, overtime situation in the NFL? I, you know, and this is going to sound old guy, but I'm mixed on it. Um, I'm a firm believer that defense matters. Yeah. And if, if, if your defense can't stop a team from scoring a touchdown on one possession, you might not deserve to get the ball back, you know, play defense. And, you know, everybody's going to look at that Buffalo, Kansas city, wild, exciting, thrilling game and saying, Oh man, it's not fair because Buffalo didn't get an opportunity to touch the football. Yes, they did. It's called defense. And the defense didn't give the offense a chance to touch the football. Not the rule book. The defense. So when you start thinking of that, I'm old school. I want to see a full quarter. I I don't want to – I prefer that to the shootout. But I prefer the shootout to the NFL over time. But there's a big part of me that wants to see a team play defense in overtime. And – you know, Buffalo did not deserve to win because 13 seconds and they couldn't yeah. stop them in overtime. Yeah. And they couldn't stop them on the drive before. 
So make a play. Stop complaining about the rule book. You didn't make a play when you needed to make a play or two plays on defense. So that's on you. That's not on the rule book. If they had just held Kansas City to even a field goal, Buffalo would have gotten the ball back. And I tried telling people that. And I said, blame the defense. Don't blame the the rules. To me, I think it's great. I like the change the NFL did, where if you hold a team to even a field goal, then you get a chance. And and, and, and Kansas City had this happen to them a couple years ago against the Patriots. Their offense or their defense didn't stop Brady, and they scored a touchdown. I apologize for my dog barking. Um, (laughs) No worries. uh, I, I'm with, and you know, maybe we're on an island to a degree, Chris, because we we prefer, you know, the both sides of the football be recognized on this. But, um, you know, I just, uh, uh, I, I guess I've come around. I and again, this is another opportunity where, as a fan of the CFL and the NFL, I can see different overtimes and appreciate uh, those overtimes for what they are. And there's a there's a wrinkle now with the NCAA where uh, you get the ball at what is it, the two or three yard line uh, after you after the first couple of possessions. Um, like we saw in the first Georgia, uh, Alabama game. Uh, I mean, it's, it's different. I don't like that one, but, um, uh, you know, I, I can live with either one of those overtime sessions. I, I don't hate the NFL one as much as most people seem to. No. And I agree. And like I said, that's the way I look at it. And if they had just did, if they had just held Kansas city to a field goal, they would have had a chance to get the ball and to, to win the game with the touchdown. So. Um, I just wanted to ask you about that. Now I got a viewer comment for you. Uh, oh. I think you Barry. Uh, hi, Mike and Chris. Thanks for doing this podcast. Can't wait to 2022. Uh, this gentleman has a question for you. Any thoughts on who the Argos should uh, look to sign for free agency? And he just wanted to make a comment. Uh, Pinball has done a great job f- uh, filling the roster so far. Yeah, I'll, I'll deal with the last half first. And yeah, the, the, the they did a great job pinball and company in locking up players to a second year a year ago. Um, I think when teams were scrambling and had a lot of unsigned players, uh, you know, some had maybe 20 players coming back. We had over 50 signed. Um, But yeah, there have been some nice additions. And more importantly, I think, excuse me, re-signing some of the players that were potentially free agents. I was terrified that Boris Beattie was going to go somewhere. Um, he is by far the best all-around kicker in the Canadian Football League in terms of kickoffs and punting and field goals. Uh, he's a weapon. And I was, man, I have met, uh, you know, uh, I, I think Boris and his agent were going to take a look down in the NFL. And uh, I don't know how that played out. I haven't spoken to Boris since uh, he re-signed. Uh, but when I heard that we were bringing him back, I, I was tickled pink. And, you know, with, with Enoch Mwamba coming back, Devaris Daniels, the receiver, is another guy that I didn't know if we were going to get back or not. So, um, you know, we had so many guys in the secondary have re-signed. Our secondary uh, secondary is virtually intact. Our offensive line is intact. Um, we're deep basically everywhere. Now we got to uh, we got to look after a couple of contracts. Uh, I saw on the weekend that Mike Clemens said that we were in discussions with McLeod Bethel Thompson to to bring Mac back uh, for another year, and I'm all about that. I, I think Mac is. Okay. Uh, a player that really isn't appreciated by a lot of uh, a lot of fans in this town, and you know he was our MOP last year. He led the team in uh, the league in touchdown passes the year of the season before. Uh, so you know it's uh, uh, I, I hope Mac is back for another year. Personally, uh, we'll see how okay. that goes. Uh, as far as reaching out and looking, uh, uh, I'm an employee of the team. I can't say. <laughs> yeah. I, I will tell you that there was uh, because that right now that would be tampering. Um, I can tell you that uh, this afternoon uh, I had two meetings and after those were done, the football ops specifically got together to talk about free agency and to, to go over. Everybody's been making their notes, obviously. Uh, everybody's been looking at their own video, uh, but I know that uh, our gang got together today. Uh, I, I assume it would have been the personnel guys and Coach Dinwiddie and his staff. Uh, getting together to talk about some of the guys that are available and uh, who we should be interested in, who doesn't really fit what we want to do, and then you know start assessing what they think the market value would be and what would be a good fit and how to approach that and maybe start ranking who we think are the most important guys out there. So um, I can tell you without lying that I don't know who's on the radar because until today, I don't know if as a group we knew who was on the radar. Um, where everybody was on board. So uh, there have been some big splashes made in the last couple of years. Uh, last year wasn't really on uh, 
the first day of free agency because we signed John White and Antonio Pipkin. And I think we had Kelly Bryant that day as well, a quarterback from Missouri. Uh, but then in the next few days, it was like Cam Judge would come aboard and a couple of guys who hadn't played in the league before that made an impact. Sean Oakman came up here and Dwayne Hendricks came up here. And that, that was in the, the two or three days following. Uh, Coney Ely. Uh, the, 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 who had that great Super Bowl for Carolina where he had three sacks and an interception and a forced fumble and a fumble recovery against Peyton Manning. Uh, you know, he came up here and then a month later we, we got Henoch Mwamba. So short term, I, I, I wish I could tell you, I wish I knew because that's, it's always nice to be able to follow. Uh, sometimes I get the, uh, the heads up in advance. Uh, I know after speaking to some of the guys in player personnel, uh, I'll write a bunch of bios just in case, so they're ready to go. So if we have, let's say we have a, a list of five guys we think we have a shot of signing, I'll write bios for them ahead of time. Uh, Chris Polanovich, my partner, writes the news releases. He'll write news releases about those players. So we have all of the information ready to go. Um, sometimes it doesn't work out. I have, uh, I, I don't think it's any state secret that we made a big push for Bo Levi Mitchell in 2019. Yeah. Uh, I had written a bio for Bo Levi Mitchell. Uh, you know, in the Argo format. So didn't work out, but we're, we're prepared just in case stuff like that happens. But uh, I'm eager to see what happens. I don't know how busy we'll have to be uh, because we have so many guys coming back, but uh, uh, I'll let, uh, you know, the guys in the front office, uh, Alex Russell is a capologist. He's going to be front and form, uh, front and center on this as well. So uh, I, I assume we'll be bringing in a couple of players. I don't know how big those players' names will be. Might be a superstar. I don't know. Uh, I'll wait and see, and I'll leave that to Pinball and Company. Okay. And uh, I see Jim Barker has uh, rejoined the Argonauts. I've 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 read up on. That's that's been the report. I don't think there's not been confirmed a yet. announcement on yet. Okay. Okay. Yet, so um, okay. if Jim if Jim were to come back, uh, he'd be a great addition. Um, Absolutely. You know, he's Absolutely. He's, you know, I think he has four great cup rings, uh, one in Montreal, two here, and one yeah. in Calgary, and in all in you know different capacities. Uh, in Montreal, he was the offensive four, he was the offensive line coach when he won there. Uh, when he won here in '97, his first year with the Argos, uh, Doug Flutie's second year, he was the offensive line coach and co-offensive coordinator with John Jenkins. Uh, he won one year in Calgary. I think he was a VP of a VP and uh, director of player personnel. And then he won here in 2012 as a general manager uh, after making arguably the best trade in Argo history for Ricky Ray. Uh, that was Jim. And, you know, Jim really set the table for Jim Pop uh, and the gang in 2017. A lot of the guys who won in 27 were Jim Barker's guys. And then nice. Jim took what Bar Pop took what Barker provided him and added, you know, his, yeah. his uh, you know, uh, put his fingerprint on it and brought in Mark Tressman and, you know, 2017, uh, was was a pretty damn good year as well. But a lot of what, what Jim and Mark were able to do in 17 was because of what Jim Barker did uh, with Scott Milanovic in 2016. And what I'm seeing with the Argos is what I'm, I've seen with Hamilton and Winnipeg is stability. And that's how fans identify with players. And that's how teams continue to win is with stability within the organization. And the Argos seem to be going in the right direction with that. I agree. It's 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 not just in our league, but it's a lot in our league because you don't have those seven year contracts like you you'll see in Austin Matthews for the Leafs for a long time, or Kyle Lowry with the Raptor, or Raptors for a long time. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. There aren't too many seven year contracts in the NFL either. Uh, those are reserved for the for the best of the best, and usually quarterbacks. Um, that's 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 the life of football: one and two year contracts. Uh, I'm with you though. I th I think the longer that we can have players. Um, identifiable to our fan base. The, the, the more of those we have, the better. And, and one of the things that Pinball wanted to do when he came in as his general manager, he wanted to get the local guys to come in back and play in Toronto. Uh, so you saw guys like, like Enoch Mwamba come back here for less money than he could have made somewhere else, or Juwan Breskison, or I think, uh, you know, Phil Blake, uh, starting offensive lineman, uh, came back. Uh, to essentially finish his playing career in, in Toronto after playing in the NFL and then in Montreal and Saskatchewan. Uh, so Phil came home. There are a lot of guys like that. And that's one of the things that we want to do is to, uh, because Toronto is such a hotbed for, for football talent, we want to make sure that the best of the guys from the GTA who don't go to the NFL want to come here and play in Toronto and, and you know, wear this thing 
with uh, with a lot of pride. And and you know, you talk to the guys who have come home, they had so much fun living at home instead of you know, the guys who have families um who who are based out of Toronto. How tough was it for Enoch Muhammad to live away from his family when he was playing in, in Montreal? It killed him. So now he's able to come home and go home to his wife and kids every day. That's huge for him. Yeah, and and for the guys who are married, uh, you know, it's a it's a big advantage uh, to go home to to your wife and kid or kids uh, every night as opposed to to being uh, you know on the road and having to do FaceTime every night. Um, I think what would would, uh, would surprise pleasantly uh, a lot of fans is how often you'll go into the locker room after practice and there's a guy sitting in his stall FaceTiming his wife and kids. Um, you know, it's it 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 it, it brings you back to reality that you know these aren't just players these are human beings and a lot of them have made a sacrifice to be away from their family for six months uh, aside from bye weeks or the occasional time that, uh, that that a spouse and kids can come up and travel and come to Canada to see daddy play football um, you know so uh, pinball's idea to bring the GTA guys home is like you know Montreal was way ahead of that curve when they had the francophones all want to play for the Alouettes and I think that also paid off in attendance because there were guys who were going to be there for four or five years, like you mentioned, that because they wanted to play in Montreal. We hope we're like that with, with young players from Toronto. We drafted Dejan Brissett. Uh, you know, we hope the receiver, who's the number two overall pick in the in the draft a couple of years ago, we hope he's here for a long time. Um, you know, we'll obviously, I hope, see him on the field a little bit more this year because when he did get in, uh, some pretty good things happened, including uh, one of the catches of the year, uh, third down conversion in Hamilton that set up the 51 yard Boris Beattie field goal. Um, so yeah, I, uh, the more guys that we can commit to play here in Toronto, especially the local guys, the better it is for the organization. And also having a coaching staff in place that the players know are going to be around does help with selling guys coming to Toronto. If you've got coaching coming, going left, right and center, the guys are like, I don't know if I want to go to that organization. I think I'm like most people uh, who knew Corey Mace as a player only. Um, you know, a, a, a Canadian going down to the NFL 10 years ago was not the norm. Corey did that with the Buffalo Bills and then came back up. He played in Calgary and was was a dynamite player. And then he gets into the coaching ranks. And when we signed him, he was a defensive line coach there for seven years, I believe. Um and he came up here, was it seven, four, four, four years, sorry. He was a defensive line coach there. He's now ready to make that jump to be a defensive coordinator. And when when we signed Corey, I was, I was trying to find out from people who knew him what he was all about. And not one person talked about his football ability first. As a player, as a coach, they talked about him as a man. And they were like, oh, you're going to love Corey. He's such a good guy. You know, he's, he, is, he wants to set up roots in the community. Uh, they talked about for his Thanksgiving, they they ran a turkey drive out there that raised over forty thousand dollars for 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 people in Calgary uh, who who could use the help around Thanksgiving. Uh, I mean, everybody was talking about what a spectacular man he is first, and then they got into what a great coach he is, what a great player he was. But that's also the kind of guy that Mike Clemens, as you can imagine, wants to attract to the to to the organization. That's why he thought Ryan Dinwiddie, you know. Oh, he's never been a full-time coordinator. Like, how, how can he do this job? He's never been a head coach before. Uh, I, you talk to the people in the organization, the reviews about year one were rave reviews. Did he make a couple of mistakes uh, in, in game in terms of clock management? Yes. He's the first guy to admit that. Those aren't going to happen again. Um, you know, but here's a guy who committed to the city, committed to the uh, to the organization, moved his family here to Toronto. They're based out of California. Uh, he moved here. Um, that's the commitment he had. He wanted to be here with his family. Um, so that's that's the buy-in. So to have coaches like that who are going to commit to the players makes it easier for the players to commit to those coaches. Absolutely. I am kind of sad to see Chris Jones leave, but he's. But you know what? I think he'll do a really good job with Edmonton, and uh, I think being a head coach and general manager it, with some help too, I think G. Roy Simon, the Lions great, is going to be the assistant GM. I think that's good for the Edmonton Elks. Yeah, absolutely. Jones, Jones is a great football guy, and he's got his detractors, uh, but Jones would move from city to city to city, and there's always a promotion there. Like he'd go from defensive coordinator to defensive coordinator and assistant head coach. He'd leave as a defensive coordinator and assistant head coach to become 
the defensive coordinator and head coach. He'd become the head coach and general manager. So there's always been that progression. And then he had the opportunity to go to the NFL for a couple of years. Um, then Jonesy went back to, uh, to Tennessee, his hometown of South Pittsburgh, Tennessee, and he was coaching high school. And the opportunity came here uh, because of the, 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 the personal choices that uh, a couple of our coaches made. One, Josh Bell, Joshua Bell, who came back this year, and, uh, and Glenn Young, who, uh, who decided again that, you know, uh, for MLSE policy, uh, he, was, uh, he was not going to uh, do what was asked and decided to go home for personal reasons, which is his absolute decision. But we needed a defensive coordinator for a team that had aspirations of winning a great cup. And, you know, the call was made to Chris Jones, and Jones talked it over with his family, and his family said, go do it. So he came up here. But you knew when Chris Jones came here as a defensive coordinator, he wasn't coming back here solely as a defensive coordinator because he's such a fo good football guy that a job would open up, whether it be a head coach or a general manager or both. And and for Jones to land in Edmonton made absolute 100% sense. And uh, personally, I'm happy he's out of the East. So if we're going to lose him, I'm glad we lost him to the West. And I'm, I'm glad. I know Edmonton had to change their name to the Elks. Uh, I'm so glad they kept their traditional colors. And oh, yeah, and they were able to keep the EE logo as well, yeah. which meant so much uh, to so many people who are longtime fans. And, you know, whenever a new team comes in, you kind of worry because, you know, we're, we're all fans of our team, but we're, we all want to see the league do well. And and you sit and you go, oh, boy, I hope they I hope they have a good logo because there are a lot of ways that they could go with this. They nailed it. I love their logo. I love their helmets. Um, it's really going to be appealing to the younger demo as well. So, uh, good on the Elks. It was it was a difficult situation to get to where they got to. Uh, I like the name because uh, I'm a bit of a football historian, and I like the fact that they went back in time to use a name that had been used in Edmonton before. But the way that they updated the logo, I love it. I, I think I think that's uh, I think they did a great job, and I know uh, it paid off in terms of merchandise because when they came up with that logo, it started flying off the shelves out there. So well done, Elks. And I'm just waiting to hear the announcement with the Washington Football Club as well, with their name yeah, change. It's just taking too long. It just pick a name. Let's go with it. Come on, let's go. Washington Definitely. Football Club. No, 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 no. Come on, let's go. It's time. It's time to pick a name. Yeah, I've heard uh, Red Hawks, and I've heard the Red Hogs. So I hope they get this decided soon. Keep keep the burgundy. I love yes. their, you know, the colors, they're a yes. divisional rival of the Eagles, but I love their uniforms. Yep. Um, you know, they're, they're old school, you know, going back. And they haven't really changed that much. You know, when I was a kid with uh, uh, even even later when I was in my teens, with, when Joe Theismann was there, but John Riggins and, and guys like that. And, and before that, you know, uh, uh, Jurgensen and Kilmer and, uh, and the guys that went uh, – to play against the Dolphins in the 72 uh, Super Bowl. You know, that, those are the teams of my youth. And to, to see, you know, these years later that Washington uh, has still kept the same color and essentially the same uniform, uh, I love that. I love the tradition. And I wish the Eagles could, could come up with a logo and stick with it. I'd like to see them go back to the ones from the, uh, the uh, 80s and the Kelly Green color uniforms. Yeah. Kelly Green. I, I yes. I've got a helmet here. This one? I see it. Yeah, let's see it. Yes, yes, definitely. The Randall Cunningham era? Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. I hate it when they went to that midnight green. I, I I you know, I there are too many uh uniforms that either incorporate black yeah. or their base color is so like a dark blue or dark yeah. green that it's almost yeah. black. I like the fact that they had the Kelly greens. I you know, I, I put me down in favor of those colors. But then again, you know, when I became an Eagles fan, it was Roman Gabriel and Wilbur Montgomery and Harold Carmichael. Yeah. Those are the jerseys that uh, that yeah. I'm partial to. Definitely. And I'm so glad the Argos went back to the Boatman logo and their uniforms well done and I hope they leave the uniforms alone now for a while. Yeah, we had the we had the boat. Um we brought back the boat logo full time and the response was like you. It was it was almost unanimous in uh, how much people like that logo and love that logo. So um, we're going to flip that over. That is going to be our primary logo. So it'll replace this one uh, yeah. as the primary. So we're happy about that. I thought the helmets were just so slick last year. Yes. Um, and the, the look that we had where we had the dark jerseys 
like the the Cambridge blue, uh, the Oxford blue, the dark blue jersey, yeah. and the Cambridge blue, the light blue pants. Yeah. yeah. I thought that was a great look. I, yes. I you know, put me down in favor of that one. Definitely. And I was going to say, I wanted to say thank you to Nick for his uh, question and watching. And are you okay for a few more minutes, Mike? I'm here. I'm yours. Okay. Uh, just a couple more questions I wanted to ask you. What do fans have to look forward to in 2022 with the Argos at BMO Field? And are they going to, like, what's the biggest thing the fans are going to be looking for in 22 if they go to a game this year? More winning by the home team. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we've got uh, essentially the same roster coming back. Uh, unfortunately, Des Dexter McCoy Sr. retired. Uh, he actually today took a job uh, coaching in the NCAA, so he wasn't out of work very long. Uh, and I assume that uh, that he had been looking to that uh, long term. But he was such an important part of our defense last year. Um, we'll we'll find a replacement. We we may have him in house already. Uh, you know. Uh, because we had so much flexibility last year, we started to bring up linebackers who can play that will spot or, you know, Dexter kind of floated around and played different opportunity or different spots uh, back there for us. But, uh, you know, uh, as a player, he's going to be tough to replace, but, you know, I have, I have faith in, in, in Vince Magri and pinball and uh, Alex Russell and whoever that new person in the personnel department might be uh, to go out and uh, find, uh, find a few more bodies and, uh, and help us win. And in terms of the bells and whistles, you know, hopefully with, with COVID restrictions being lifted, hopefully we're getting through this, uh, you know, to see the cheer team come back uh, with more of a presence. Uh, hopefully we're able to open up the, uh, the North end patio for, for gatherings before the game. Uh, we had some pretty good momentum up there. Uh, you know, I'd go and interview pinball up there before the game or Jim pop before him. And that got a good response. Cheerleaders were up there. There was a DJ up there. You could, you could stand in that north end patio and watch the uh, watch the warm ups. Uh, so you could go say to a buddy, "Hey, I'm going to be there a little earlier. I'll meet you in the north end. I'll be I'll be leaning on the rail watching the warm ups." And you'd have something to do, having a cold beer and watching uh, the pregame. So there was always a lot of stuff to do. You know, the tailgate uh, seemed to to keep growing organically in the south parking lot. Uh, boy, the the I, I can't tell you how happy I was to see how big that tailgate got for the Eastern final. Uh, it was to sit up in the, in the press box and just look down and go, wow, that's big. Um, that was great. So there's always going to be stuff to do before the games. Uh, I'm, I'm sure our in-game folks will keep folks entertained. And uh, one of the great things we have is when we score the touchdown, we shoot off the cannon and we always have a camera trained on people in the seats near the cannon. And if they don't know the cannon's coming, some of the reaction shots are gold <laughs> of people. It looks like they're they're going to pee themselves. Like they're so, <laughs> uh, it's it's fantastic. So we have fun with the cannon as well. And you know the the the, the thing that we have to do is keep winning. And and uh, I I have uh, no doubt uh, that if we're a healthy team, we're going to be uh, great cup competitors again, just like we were last year. Yeah, um, I'm predicting 12 wins this year for the Argonauts. I'll take that. We can we pen that in. Yeah, 12, 12, 12, 12. 12. I'll start with 12, and if we go over 12, that's great. But, yeah, the yep. 12 and 6 would be great. 12 and 6, that's what I uh, predict. Nice. Definitely. Um, marketing with this team, too, are they going to try to get the players out a little bit more, too, so people can identify them a little more? That's just my two cents on that. No, no, that's great. And you're bang on. We had a meeting about that uh, earlier this week, about not only – uh, not only getting the brand out there a little bit more in terms of the Argonaut, the logo, the team, but to make sure that we're getting our players out there a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, Enoch Mwamba came to me a week ago or a couple of weeks ago and said, I, I, do you know if I can, can talk about the NFL somewhere? Like he's a guy that wants to get into broadcasting after his career is over. Uh, so I set it up. So he's now doing a weekly hit on TSN 1050 uh, as, uh, as an NFL insider. And, you know, people know Enoch mostly for his days in the Canadian Football League, but uh, he spent some time in Indianapolis. He was with a team that got to the AFC Championship game. He played in that game. So, uh, you know, he's he's been there. He's done that. Um, so, so to hear somebody with Enoch's passion for the sport and his knowledge, uh, breaking it down with Matt Cause, I've listened to the first couple of installments, and it's uh, it's been dynamite. He's uh, he's a natural and. Uh, when he's uh, when he retires, which I hope is you know five to ten years from now, selfishly speaking, uh, he's a natural to, to to go on the panel or go up into the booth uh, at TSN. 
Okay. And uh, I just want to ask you a couple NFL questions. Now, before I get to this question, have you uh, heard from Sean and his dad, Joe, since the Packers were eliminated by the Niners? Because I see yeah. they, they're awfully quiet on social media. I haven't talked to Bo and the Elder, but uh, I did talk to Sean. And if those don't know, Sean is, if, if you see our social media, Sean's the guy, one of the guys doing the interviews and and the video bits. And we do a keys to the game uh, the, the, the day or two before the game that runs uh, at the stadium as well uh, for home games. But uh, yeah, they're all Packers fans, diehard. I mean, they, they go down every year. They've got the, the you know, they've got a Winnebago with, with Packer colors and Notre Dame colors on it yep. uh, because the whole family is all Packer. They're, they're Packers, they're Leafs, they're Argos, they're Notre Dame. Like, I mean, that's what yep. you need. The yep. whole family yep. Yep. Is, is the same. So they go, they're, they're Packer diehards and it was pretty quiet. And, you know, um, I was on a, a, a conference call or a, a, a bigger call with Bowen on uh, Monday, and yeah, he was down. He he, he didn't think they'd yeah. lose in the first round. We have a bunch of Packer fans in our office, and that scares me a little bit. Uh, but it was tough. Chris Belenovich, the guy that I work with, who's our manager of football media, he's another Packer diehard, and I talked to him today. I thought I'd give him a couple of days, and uh, he's he did not think they were going to lose to San Francisco. And uh, hopefully, hey, if the Rams have that attitude, they might lose again. The Niners have beaten the Rams six straight times, and this Niner team might not be the most talented team, Mike, but you can't measure heart and character. And they're it's playing with a lot of heart. I'm sure you watched the Eagle game against San Francisco earlier this season. Yes, and yep. I'll be honest. I didn't, think, I didn't think either team was any damn good. Uh, I didn't think either team was going to get to the playoffs. Uh, it's funny what, what can happen in a long season. And, uh, you know, the the – the Eagles found what they needed to do by running the football. Um, you know, I, I will not pretend to be a 49ers expert, but uh, that's a team that didn't look like a playoff team that's now making a playoff run uh, and is in sort of the, the, the final four here. So uh, good for them. But, you know, if you're going to sit back and say, excuse me, analyze the difference between week one and playoff week three uh, for, uh, for San Francisco, yep. there's a difference, but I can't sit there and, and pick apart exactly why. Um uh, I, 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 I'm not in my old job where I had to do that every game, but uh, um, I just uh, I just sat back and I watched San Francisco and I liked what I saw. I didn't love what I saw, but I liked what I saw. Yeah, and like you said, the Eagles, they found their identity too. Um, my question for you is, what are your overthoughts of this 21 Eagles team? And do you think long-term – Jalen Hurts can develop into an elite quarterback if they give him some more weapons on the offensive side of the ball to throw to. First part first about the season, I was really disappointed in the Eagles season, and I'll tell you why. I wanted them to lose every damn game. Um, I wanted to lose every game 40 to 38 because I saw what was happening with the offense and how good this offense can be. I wanted them to lose to have a higher draft pick, and uh, they weren't going to win the Super Bowl anyway. No, so no. not look at this as a developmental year, which they did. Uh, so to be honest, to be honest, I was disappointed they made the playoffs. I'd rather have picked ten than pick nineteen with their own pick. Uh, Jalen Hurts, I like a lot of what I see. I love a lot of what I see, and I cringe at some of the stuff that I see. And I think that's just uh, part and parcel of being a young quarterback in the National Football League. Uh, you know, this was his first year as a full-time starter. And he can do things in the league that a lot of guys can't do at that position. His running is fluid. And I don't know who the linebacker on New Orleans was, uh, but there's a juke move he made in that game uh, where, he, where he made a linebacker miss so badly. He could have made that move in a phone booth, for those of you who remember what phone booths are. And, and I think the guy would have grabbed air. Um, there's a shot from the end zone where you can see Hertz moving and he hits hard this way and the guy bites and Hertz just goes this way, runs around, goes in for a touchdown. It's an amazing, or not a touchdown, but inside the 10, it's an amazing run. And, uh, just that move. He's so fluid. He throws well when he's on the move. He can give you that, that, that added dimension that a lot of quarterbacks don't have. He's got a strong arm. He doesn't have Carson Wentz strong arm. Or Josh got, Allen strong arm. Or Josh yeah. Allen, Allen strong arm, yeah. the elite. But he's got a, more than a serviceable arm in terms of arm strength. And 
he, he the way that he would prolong plays and you'd see him make a throw eight seconds into a play where normally a guy's throwing the ball out of bounds or he's on his back. And if you continue to develop the receivers and give Devontae Smith more guys to work with and Dallas Goddard more guys to work with, it, if 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 it happens to be Rieger, you know, if I'm, he, not, I'm not sold on him. No, I, I and it's easy not to because there were more disappointments and positives the last couple of years. But here's a guy who had obviously obvious some amount of talent, or they wouldn't have picked him where they did. And the pressure, you know, seeing on uh, Minnesota drafted right behind them, that doesn't help either. And you know, c- can there be something there if he becomes a solid third option? Um, if 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 the Eagles are going to draft another wide receiver at some point in the draft this year, and they're going to have a lot of chances to do it. Um, you know, is is that where they go, and does that take pressure off Rieger, where he's not seeing the number one or number two corner? He's playing against a nickelback, and maybe that's what he needs, or he's playing against a safety. Uh, maybe that's what he needs to take that next level, because if he's playing against a nickel or a, a safety, on paper, there should be a huge speed advantage for Rieger. Now, can he catch the ball when he gets it? Another question. Um but it's, I just wanted to see the offense develop because for the most part, I just want to blow up the defense and I want to st- uh, the, I want to use the majority of the free agent money and the first three at least of the first four draft picks used on defense. Yeah, I was going to say Rieger, he's still got two years left on his contract. I just think he, he right now reminds me of Nelson Aguilar. Uh, there's times where Aguilar, when he was with Philly, could make great catches and great plays, and then he would drop passes that he should – consistency. And, yeah. and I'd like to see more of that if they do keep him uh, next year as well, is more consistency. And I don't. what's your take on Quaz Watkins? Because I think he's one of the fastest players in the National Football League. Yeah, and that's that's why I, 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 I'm not – Certain the Eagles are going to take a, a, a receiver uh, high in the draft. Maybe they get somebody a little bit lower uh, because I just think that there's something there. There's something, you know, obviously, you know, Devontae Smith, he was, he was a guy that I wanted in the draft. Uh, the fact that the Eagles were able to trade down, get the guy that I wanted in the draft. Uh, and that includes, you know, Chase and the other guys that were there ahead of him. Uh, I, I just see this guy as being, you know, uh, Deshaun Jackson 2.0. Uh, you know, size, speed, uh, the way that he makes guys miss. Uh, there's just there's a similarity in games between those two. Um, and 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 Smith may have even better hands. So, uh, you know, that guy I'm not worried about. Um, the offense with that line, I'm less worried about. Um, I just want to see another full year with uh qb1 under center uh with him with hertz as a qb1 uh that's what i want to see first and foremost and let's not forget three first round picks this year 15 16 and 19 a second round pick this year they get 20 million dollars back in cap space that they had to use on carson Wentz last year uh brandon brooks just retired there's another 12 million dollars all of a sudden they've got 32 million additional dollars in cap space and you would assume four starters coming through the draft. Holy smokes. If you, you're going to get two elite players or three really good players for $30 million. And you're going to get, you could, you could get seven starters, seven new starters this year, just out of the first group, two rounds of the draft and the, the, the added money in free agency. And it's not like Brandon Brooks is going to be missed. Because as great as he was, he's been hurt more than he's been healthy the last yeah. couple of years. So you already have the replacement there. So yeah. you're essentially keeping the same offensive line. Brooks was a great player. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, this offensive line, I think, is as good. What I saw this year, this Eagle line is as good as any Eagle li- line from tackle to tackle as I may have ever seen. And that's saying something because they've had some great players on the O-line. But just... Person one to person five, they work so well together, and maybe Hertz made them look a little bit better by giving them more time. Uh, but you know, I don't even think you have to go O line. I, I, I think you go three defensive players, and if you want to go O line, if you want to go wide receiver, fill your boots. But uh, that player better be able to play and start immediately if you're going to do that with that kind of draft pick. But I, I tell you, man, I want an edge rusher, I want a linebacker, and I want two DBs. That's what I want. 
And I was going to say, um, I expect them to compete for the NFC East next year because I am not sold on Dallas, and I don't think the Giants are going to be doing much next year. And I think Washington will see what happens with their quarterback situation. But I really think the NFC East next year is still going to come down to Dallas and, and Philadelphia. Yeah, I, th- I think it's Dallas's to lose uh, right now. But, you know, talk to me in May after free agency and the draft. And let's see how NFL ready the draft picks are. Um, If they're ready to step in and start, you're expecting a first round player to make a contribution, if not come in and and win the starting job outright. Um, So there's an opportunity here for the Eagles to get a lot better faster than they've done maybe ever, just because of the the cap space that's been added and the the three – first round draft picks, 15, 16, and 19. So that's going to be key. And before I let you go, um, we've already talked about the Bills Chiefs game. So what I wanted to ask you is NFL games this weekend, Bengals and Chiefs in Kansas City. Can the Bengals upset the Chiefs again at Arrowhead? And can the Niners beat the Rams for the seventh straight time, third straight time this year in LA? Um, Cincinnati better be able to protect Joe Burrow. Uh, Oh, my God. Uh, nine sacks given up last week. That was terrible. Uh, that was that was embarrassing. And the fact that he was able to win that game and produce as much through the air as he did tells me a lot about him as a player. Uh, you know, how many guys would have taken that third sack, fourth sack, and just became so PO'd at their offensive line that would get to them mentally. But, you know, Joe went back, took his time, looked for that – Big rookie, that is old teammate at LSU Chase. That's some magic working there, man. That's uh, they're fun to watch. And um, the, do they have a chance of beating Kansas City? Hell yeah. Do I like them as a favorite? No. But uh, you know, this. Who knows? Maybe we, maybe we end up with a a game almost exciting. Certainly not the last two minutes. Are we going to get that kind of? Was it twenty five points or something in the 25 last twenty five points? Yeah. Minutes? That's insane. That's a CFL game. Yeah. Um, just yeah. Crazy. You're not going to see that again. So it's a tough act to follow, but I, I think that could be a really exciting game. And boy, how much, how much do the Rams like that Matt Stafford trade right now? Um, boy, that, that all, they look good, not perfect again, but really good uh, in their, in their win over Tampa. Um, you know, I hated some of the clock manage. I, I thought they I thought some of the things they did offensively with that kind of lead in the last 10 minutes, we're just asinine. So maybe that's lesson learned for the coaching staff. Uh, be a little bit more conservative. Um, you know, that that snap where where uh, Stafford and the center weren't on the same page and went flying by his head uh, into a turnover, why isn't he under center? Why is the backfield empty at that stage? Makes no sense to me at all. So uh, hopefully from the Rams' perspective, that's a lesson learned. So uh, And San Francisco, like I say, I don't love them, uh, but I like them. Uh, I think I think I'll go with a Rams Chiefs Super Bowl. Uh, that'll be my prediction. But uh, uh, I wouldn't be stunned with either either the other team winning. They've got to be a good team, man. They're in the Final Four. Definitely. And uh, if it's Rams and Chiefs in Super Bowl Fifty Six, who wins it? Right now, just the way that offense is humming in in Kansas City. But you look at that defense, you know, how much time is Mahomes going to have? Uh, that's the cat and mouse. I know I talk a lot about line play, but uh, to me, you don't have anything if you don't have good offensive and defensive lines. And, um, you know, uh, that's part of the reason I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm kind of a lot surprised Tennessee uh, bowed out when they did and because their offensive and defensive lines were so good. And we saw how good the defensive line was, as we mentioned, nine sacks against Joe Burrow. Uh, but um, you know, I'll I'll have to go. I'll have to go, Ken. Maybe it's the Andy Reid fan in me, but uh, uh, gotta go with uh, gotta go with Kansas City at this stage. City. And it's going to be an interesting off season too, because I Who think picking? I'm picking the Chiefs to win the Super Bowl because of Andy Reid and Jason's brother Travis Kelsey, the best tight end in football, and uh, I, I just. I can't hate Patrick Mahomes, and they're a likable team. There's nobody on that team I, I dislike as a player. So, By the way, uh, Jason Kelsey is now – he's moved up. He's now my second favorite Eagle of all time. 
And he's going to be in the Hall of Fame, I think. Oh, just, yeah, another All Pro selection. Brian Dawkins is nobody's. Yes. Gonna, I don't think anybody will ever touch Brian Dawkins uh, yeah. in terms of being a favorite player. But Kelsey has gone past, you know, Reggie White and Randall Cunningham and uh, Wilbert Montgomery and and uh, Harold Carmichael and Bill Berge and so many great players they've had on that team. And you know, it's strange to talk about an offensive lineman. But, man, to see him get out and get to that second and third level as often as he does and uh, the leadership and, you know, he will always be remembered for his epic Super Bowl speech in the Mummer's costume, uh, which I could watch probably every day and never get bored of it. Uh, he's just – he's a unique dude. And if I'm not mistaken, he was Zach Kolaris's roommate at Cincinnati. Wow. And I was going to say uh, I'm hoping Jason comes back for one more year. Yeah. That would be nice. And, you know, it's funny because now I think they have to draft a center. They did that last year with Dickinson out of Alabama. Yes. Uh, and it's a pick that a lot of people didn't like, but I loved. You know, there's there's the health question with him. Um, I thought, okay, you play him at guard and then you move him in at center. But, boy, he was good at guard this year. I don't even yes. know if you move him. You're like, you just no. say, okay, you're you're there. Like, stay stay there. Like, you're really good. And uh, and just, you know, try to work in another center in the draft if you if – you, if you see a guy who is is willing to learn, and that's that's the great thing about having four picks in the first two round and your third and your fourth, that you can, excuse me, you can wait on a guy because mm -hmm. you're going to get an influx of talent this year through free yeah. agency and through the draft. If you see a guy that you identify, and we're not going to talk about how Roseman's record in the draft, uh, but yeah. but but if you see that guy and you think he's a guy, and you've got an offensive line coach who goes. That guy's going to fit into my system perfectly. Get him. Um, and they take him to, to, to have him learn a year behind Kelsey, uh, arguably the best center of his generation. Uh, man, that's that's a bonus. And that's one I could I could I could live with that pick if that center is going to be the starter in two years to have him come in and learn for a year. He doesn't have if there's a guy in the second round or a guy in the first round. Uh, that they think is going to be that guy. I, I don't mind that and, and and waiting for a year on that. And when Jason does retire, I would love to see him stay on with the coaching staff as an offensive line coach because I think he would be really good at it. Because he's so passionate and he's that X's and O's guy. And, you know, I I, I hope that he gets the honor. I, it, it, I didn't want to see it end this way, but when Brian Dawkins signed with Denver mm -hmm. and I found out that Denver was going to be playing in Philadelphia, there was nothing that was going to keep me away from that game. And I got tickets. I sat in the end zone. And to show you the love for people who aren't Eagles fans, uh, the love that that city had, probably 80% of the jerseys in the crowd that day had a number 20 on them. The guy next to me had a road. The guy next to him had one of those old gold throwbacks. The guy next to me on the other side had a uh, Clemson jersey. The guy in front of me had one of the black Dawkins. Like everybody had different Dawkins jersey in in my neck of the woods. It was uh, it was great to see. I went with the home green one, but uh, man, he's uh, he's awesome. And 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 to put Kelsey very close to him on my depth chart talks uh, a lot about an offensive lineman, what he's meant to the organization, how good he's been, the personality, and just the fact that he lives and dies Eagles football. You want to be that guy. You want to have those guys on your team, which may go back to our conversation about having guys with the Argos long term. That's that's one of the things we want to do is have fans identify with our players, some of our players at least, the way that you and I are able to talk about Dawkins and able to talk about Kelsey as being guys who were there for five or six years, stayed healthy for the most part, and, and contribute the way they did or even longer than six years just uh, a guy like Dawkins was a unicorn man he's Definitely. he doesn't come along and I'm, I've seen the Eagles play four times on the road in Green Bay and Buffalo I'm hoping in 2022 I can finally go to my first game in Philadelphia oh it's 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 such a beautiful stadium and you know when I went to the games that I did back at Veterans Stadium there would always be fights in the parking lot there'd always be fights in the stands we counted one Giants game uh, it was a game against the Giants. It was in December, and it was for a playoff spot. And the 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 the, the security guys wore those really bright neon green jerseys or coats, so you could see where they were. 
And I think we counted 50 fights, including two guys immediately behind us. And one of the guys was there with his like six year old daughter. It was brutal. It was a terrible spot to watch a football game. There weren't enough bathrooms. It was a toilet. It was an awful place. The link is spectacular. I have not even seen an argument at a tailgate, a pregame, a fight. And I've seen a couple of Giants games and a Cowboys game in there and didn't see even an argument. They may be going on, but uh, I have not personally witnessed one. I haven't read about bad ones. It's just it, it. people, I think, respect the stadium so much who remember how bad the place that used to be across the street was. Uh, boy, I'm glad they're at a veteran stadium. It was such an awful, awful place to watch football and even worse place to play. There was a there was big ruts and seams in the in yep, the, in the turf. turf. There was a receiver. I think his name was Wendell Davis with with the, the, Bears. the Bears. Yeah, he ran a he ran a seam route. Got caught in the got hit. Got caught in the turf. Broke his leg in two places and never played a game in the NFL again. It was an awful. Chris Schultz talked to me about that place and what an awful place that was for your knees and joints. It was like playing like go out in the parking lot, paint it green, and that was that was the surface in Philadelphia. A terrible, a terrible building. Well, I I went to a couple of baseball games there as a twelve year old kid to see the Phillies and Expos, and I liked it, but I never played on the field. So, and I've heard that as well. So, uh, the Link's definitely an upgrade over the Vet. And there, I don't know what the sponsor is now, but the base, all of the stadiums, as you know, if you've been to the to the Vet, every stadium's on the the same complex. Like the Vet Veteran Stadium at one time, Veteran Stadium, the new ballpark. The link, yeah, the uh, whatever the, the new spectrum and the old spectrum were up yep. at the same time. So you had the five buildings were all up at the same time, uh, and now it's just the hockey arena, the baseball and football stadiums. Um, they're all in the they share the parking lots. It's it's right in South Philly. It's easy to get to on SEPTA, Southeast Pennsylvania Transit Authority. So it's easy to take the subway down to the. It's an easy place to get in and out. There's way too much parking. It's right on the expressway. Like it's an easy building to get to, and the stadiums are so. I've never been in the hockey basketball facility, but the baseball facility is just yes beautiful. Yes, I've been there. To Citizens Bank Park. It's yeah, nice. is it still Citizens Bank Park. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't know if they had changed sponsors or not. Not yet, not yet. That's the problem in this area. You never know what the stadiums call because it changes sponsorship so many times. times. But uh, you know, even when Lincoln Financial Group doesn't sponsor that field, I think local fans will call it the Link forever. Definitely. Definitely. Anyways, Mike, I'm going to let you go, but I just want to say thank you so much for coming on my live with CDP podcast and where can my audience find you again on social media and, and the Argonauts website and all that. Yeah. Argonauts.ca. You can find all the written material up there and just all of your Argonaut news and get uh, depth charts and rosters and everything you need, uh, especially leading up to, uh, uh, leading up to free agency and during free agency. We're going to be updating that hopefully uh, on a regular basis with uh, with new players that we're going to be adding. And then uh, you can find me at Mike Hogan Argos, uh, very easy to remember. And uh, I, if, if you have a question or a comment, I'll get back to you. I love uh, I love talking to people and, and, and being that conduit between fan and team and fan and league uh, because uh, everybody's so passionate with the Argos about what we do and we just want to open our arms and invite you in and, and have you become part of the family. And, uh, you know, we're going in the right direction. We're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll have more bums in the seats. We'll have more diehard Argo fans and we're riding a wave and we want to continue to watch it grow. Okay. And, uh, I was going to say again, uh, I'll look forward to keeping in touch with you and hopefully I can run into you and Sean, uh, when I come to a game on July 16th against Saskatchewan. Let me know when it happens, and if you uh, you want to, if we're in Guelph this year and you're going to head over, let us know. Definitely. Okay. Well, Mike, thank you so much for talking to CFL, the Argos, and our Philadelphia Eagles, and we'll definitely keep in touch with you on, on social media. And look at you. We talked about on my first visit here how much it, reps are going to help you as a podcaster. How much better do you think you are than the first time that we, we spoke? It's nice I think, day, pal. You think I'm a lot better? Not even remotely close to being a comment. You have improved a thousandfold. Well, thank you. And Jerry Howarth told me that too. And I'm like, 
and I said to Jerry, I, I, I had to say thank you to him, but it, it, I'm just trying to keep working hard, grinding away at this, and and uh, I'm not giving up on my dreams. I, I'm I'm going to keep at this, and I love doing this. That's that's part of the reason I want to come on and help you do these. And anytime you need me to come on, pick up the phone, drop me an email. You know how to get in touch with me. Definitely. Thank you so much, Mike, and we'll definitely be in touch with you on social media. Thanks, pal. We'll talk soon. Good night. You too. Good night, Mike. Anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed my podcast tonight with Mike Hogan, uh, the play-by-play voice of the Toronto Argonauts. He's also their uh, commu- manager of communications, and he's also their uh, digital writers for Argonauts.ca. The Toronto Argonauts 2022 CFL home opener is on Thursday, June 16th versus the Montreal Alouettes at 7.30, kickoff at BMO Field. I'm hoping to go to a game on Saturday, July 16th at 7.30 against Saskatchewan. So I'm hoping to attend a couple Argos games this year at BMO Field, and I expect this Argo team to be a Grey Cup contender. So uh, just one other thing, guys. The 109th Grey Cup this year will be at Mosaic Stadium in Saskatchewan, and I'm looking forward to that as well. And let's see, guys. Um, CFL. If you guys want to check out the CFL.ca site, the schedule for 2022 is already out for all the teams as well. And let's see. I'm going to do some comments before I go, guys. Um, Nick, thank you for watching. Great question. And I've already done that. Uh, Let's see. Thanks, guys. Once again, it was awesome to listen to some great articles banner tonight. Can't wait for June. Uh, Nick, same here. Thank you for watching my podcast, and thanks for your great question with uh, uh, Mike Hogan as well. Huge Argos fan since 1979. So, uh, again, thank you, buddy, for watching as well. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone watching live on my YouTube channel. Please subscribe if you haven't. Uh, thank you to everyone watching on Facebook Live and my Twitter page at Chris D. Pome as well. And also, guys, Live with CDP podcast, the audio version, will be downloaded onto Google Podcasts, Anchor FM, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify, CastBox, and LinkedIn as well. And also, you guys can follow me now on TikTok at Live with CDP. I, uh, I do a lot of video content there for my podcast as well. and. Also, guys, Live with CDP merchandise, podcast shirts are 15, coffee mugs 15. If you want one of my podcast hats or 18, if you're interested, just please let me know. And again, guys, you can follow Mike Hogan on Twitter at Mike Hogan Argos. That's at Mike Hogan at Argos. And you can also check out the Argonauts website at uh, www.argonauts.ca as well. And let's see, guys. Uh, let's see. Just a little more as of January 31st, uh, the Gulf Storm uh, f- first three home games in February, uh, the Storm can have 500 fans in the arena. And by February 21st, the Storm can have 50% capacity. And if everything goes well in Ontario, uh, March 14th, by March 14th, they can have full capacity again as well. And speaking of the Storm, their home, the Storm are back home this Friday night. January 28th, 7.30, face-off at Sleeman Center against the Windsor Spitfires. And I will be doing camera work for Rogers TV. Game is 7.30 on Rogers and CJOY 1460. And then they take on the Owen Sound attack this Saturday, January 30th, and Owen Sound as well. And uh, also, guys, NFL Conference Championships uh, next, this Sunday coming up. Uh, Cincinnati at Kansas City, 3 p.m. kickoff at CBS. I'm picking the Chiefs or the Bengals. And then you got the Niners at Rams at 6.30 kickoff on Fox. I'm picking the Rams to win, but don't be shocked if the Niners win as well. And let's see, guys. Sean Payton stepped down as a head coach of the Saints after 15 years. Uh, he's not necessarily retiring from coaching, but looks like he's going to take a, a one-year break, maybe in broadcasting as well. And uh, let's see. The Chiefs-Bills game, uh, Thrill got 42.7 million viewers on CBS. Uh, best division NFL divisional playoff game in five years. Peaked at 51.7 million during the great ending. And you know what? Since I'm on here, I'm going to show a little clip of this game too. And uh, just one second, guys. Just bear with me. And we'll just show a little clip of uh, the last two minutes of this game. This clip, clip is courtesy of the National Football League. Again, this uh, video clip is courtesy of the National Football League. It's just uh, the last two minutes of this game, which was crazy. Touchdown, Buffalo. Davis again. This is 
It's just it's impossible to strike. Did you know your developers could be five times more productive? Caught it for the two. Down the middle. It's Hill in the open. Cuts it upfield. He might be done. He is. Kansas City takes the lead with a minute to go from 64 incredible yards. Well, we talked about Josh Allen needed to make it. He plays, and then all of a sudden you've got Superman himself comes out, and he shows you Patrick Mahomes. You saw one deep exhale from Mahomes. Now the next play, second down, zips it, got it. It's Davis in the secondary and knocked down. On the sideline, again, it's Davis in Western New York. Here he goes. Ball caught and a flag down. That's Emmanuel Sanders at the 19. There's going to be plenty of time for some throws into the end zone. From the 19 in 17 seconds. Down the middle to the end zone, and there it is! Touchdown number four on the night for Davis. I want you to watch the communication up here. Beaten up like that. Could this right there, here's Hill. They're going to have a chance. And they call time out quickly. They actually 84. have a chance to get Bucker in field goal range here. Hail Mary kicks. Got to throw it right away right now to someone in the middle. Down the middle. Oh, my goodness. It's going to be a 48-yard attempt. Only 48 yards. That's what it'll be. I'm so nervous. So uh, hundreds of thousands around the planet. The kick is good. It's going overtime. Second and six. Minute open. And the roll. It's off and goes out of bounds. Looking to the end zone for the win. He caught it. Game. Anyways, that clip was courtesy of the National Football League. Anyways, that was an insane game between the Bills and Chiefs, but I'm in favor of the overtime rules. Uh, if the Bills defense had just held Kansas City to a punt or even a field goal attempt or a field goal, they would have got the ball back. So, And that game should have never gone into overtime. Uh, Buffalo had 13 seconds left, and they played prevent defense, and they basically let Kansas City win that game. So uh, I'm in, in favor of keeping the overtime rules the way they are. That was one of the greatest games of all time. Buffalo will be back next year. So I'm picking Kansas City to win the Super Bowl over the Rams. I just think Patrick Mahomes is the Michael Jordan of the NFL. And I think he's the best player, best quarterback in the NFL. So uh, anyways, uh, just to let you know, my next live with CDP podcast to be announced. Uh, I'm not sure. I might be taking a one-week break next week. So uh, if I happen to do a podcast next week, I will let you guys know. But I'm working on some uh, guests for uh, uh, February to come on live with CDP uh, as well. So. All right, guys, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone watching this live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and everybody who listens to this podcast later on audio as well. Um, that's about it. Um, like I said, guys, uh, I hope everybody has a great night and enjoys the uh, NFL conference games on Sunday. Cincinnati and Kansas City at 3 o'clock, Rams and Niners at 6.30, and uh, Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be back soon on uh, live with CDDP podcast. And uh, I am working on for more guests in February. Um, I had 11 podcasts in December and today was my uh, 12th podcast. So uh, 23 podcasts in the last uh, two months is pretty good. And this is, uh, I just finished season two, episode 55. So my next podcast will be year three and podcast episode number one coming up. So uh, stay tuned. I've got a, a guest coming on in February from The Athletic, and uh, it should be interesting to talk to this guest as well. So all right, guys, uh, have a great night, 
And uh, maybe some of you guys will see me at uh, Sleeman Center uh, doing some camera work for the Rogers TV and the Gulf Storm. So I hope everybody has a great night. And again, thank you uh, to Mike Hogan from the Toronto Argonauts uh, for coming on live with CDP uh, and talking uh, CFL, Argos, and some Eagles football. Have a great night, guys, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.